the theory of karma, as causation holds that executed actions of an individual affect the individual and the life he or she lives. And the intentions of an individual affect the individual and the life he or she lives. Disinterested actions, or unintentional actions do not have the same positive or negative karmic effect, as interested and intentional actions. The force generated by a person's actions held in Hinduism and Buddhism to perpetuate transmigration and in its ethical consequences to determine the nature of the person's next existence. With the premise that every action has a consequence, which will come to fruition in either this life or a future life. Thus, morally good acts will have positive consequences, whereas bad acts will produce negative results. An individual's present situation is thereby explained by reference to actions in his present or on previous lifetimes. Karma is not itself reward and punishment, but the law that produces consequence. Good karma is considered as dharma and leads to punya, while bad karma is considered a dharma and leads to pap. The executed executioner, Alfred Horace Wells Jr., also known as Al, born in Pueblo, Colorado, on February 5, 1910. He was the first child of railroad worker Alfred Horace Wells Sr. and Vivian Helen King. A year after his birth, Vivian delivered a little girl, Pauline, who lived for one day. Sadly, Vivian followed her daughter in death just two weeks later. When Alfred Horace Wells Jr. was five, his father married Violet Payton. His work with the railroad called the Wells family to Las Vegas, New Mexico, where Violet gave birth to David Raymond in 1916, Norman in 1917, and Violet Helen in 1921. In 1926, Alfred Sr.'s job caused the family to relocate to San Bernardino, California. In 1930, the family moved a third time to Bakersfield, where he became sick and passed away. The family scattered after the death of their patriarch. Mother Violet brought her daughter, Violet, to Vista, California. Raymond moved back to San Bernardino, where he worked with the Santa Fe Railroad like his late father and married Jean Rhodes. Al drifted between Los Angeles and Orange County and began his career as a criminal. Alfred's first prison stint came on April 3, 1935, when he was arrested during the commission of a gas station robbery in Fullerton, California. He was also convicted of three counts of robbery in Los Angeles County. The judge ordered Alfred to serve five years to life, with all of his sentences running concurrently. Alfred Prison Record notes he was nearly 4, 11, tall and hunchbacked due to a back injury. If he had any limitations, he didn't show it. Alfred worked as a prison laborer. During his incarceration, California stopped executing condemned prisoners by hanging in favor of the gas chamber. Alfred worked on the crew that installed the new death machine and relished any opportunity to explain its mechanisms to other prisoners. He'd end these stories by saying, that's the closest I ever want to come to the gas chamber. For whatever reason, the state saw fit to parole Alfred 22 months into his sentence. His freedom would leave three members of the Wells family dead and one orphaned. On the afternoon of May 7, 1941, Alfred bought a gun from his neighbor, William Stroud, for a couple of books and a carton of smokes. By 3.30 p.m., 
Al was knocking on Ray's door with a gun tucked into his pants. Against her better judgment, Jean opened the door and let Alfred her brother-in-law in. Alfred told Jean he had a job opportunity at a chicken ranch, in Kachan Pass and needed to be there by 7 p.m. Jean didn't believe Alfred would hurt her and agreed to take him. Rose, a friend Jean brought from Escondido for a visit, came along for the ride and held Jean's daughter, Hester, on her lap in the middle seat. From the passenger seat, Alfred rattled off driving directions. Alfred Wells, instructed Jean to make a left here or a right there until the party reached a point two miles northwest of Devore Heights, just off Route 66, where Alfred told her to stop. The road ahead was too rough, Alfred Wells claimed, and this spot gave her a wide berth for an easy turnaround. Only Alfred Wells had no job opportunity and no intention of letting Jean out off of the canyon road alive. When Jean finally parked, Alfred Wells pointed his gun at Jean and asked, Where is Violet? When Jean feigned ignorance, Alfred made sure she had a pen and paper to take a note for Ray. As Jean handed the note to Alfred Wells, he asked a final time if she had anything to say. Jean begged him not to hurt little Hester. Alfred Wells scooped the child up with his left arm, drew his revolver, and shot his sister-in-law twice in the chest. Jean died instantly. Alfred next set his sights on 17-year-old Rose, who was completely innocent in the whole mess. He tried to tell her how he wouldn't hurt her if she'd only follow his instructions. Alfred Wells, told Rose he didn't care what she said to her parents once he was gone. Rose didn't trust his words, so she ran for her life. As she did, Alfred Horace Wells Jr. shot her in the back twice. Rose immediately fell to the ground wounded but not dead. She peeped through half-closed eyes and watched Al place the baby on Hester's chest. The teenaged girl listened to the sound of Alfred Wells, walking through the shrubbery to inspect both of the women. Rose was so quiet and still, Al thought she was dead. Finally, Rose heard the engine of Jean's car. She remained there playing dead until that sound disappeared. When Lester and Lars found her, it was too late. Just as she thought, she was dying. An ambulance brought the mortally wounded girl to St. Bernardine's Hospital, where doctors and nurses did their best until the morning of May 9th, when Rose took her last breath. In her dying hours, she was able to relay the full story to the police. After Alfred shot Jean and Rose, he drove back to Ray's house and waited. He didn't want to alert the neighbors, so he parked Ray's car at the end of Spruce Street, a block over. Ray hadn't returned from work yet, so Alfred Wells lit a joint and sat on the front porch singing songs. Shortly after 10 p.m., Ray walked home and noticed Alfred Wells on the porch. Same as with Jean, Alfred Wells asked his brother if he knew where Violet was. Ray denied knowing anything about Violet's disappearance. When Alfred Wells outright accused him of taking her away, Ray reminded him that Violet was his sister and he had every right to protect her if he needed to. Alfred Wells replied that she was as much his sister as Ray's, and by that logic, he had a right to know where she was. The conversation carried into the house, and Ray realized that his wife, house guest, and baby were gone. Before he could ask where they were, Alfred Wells, 
handed Ray the note written by Jean. Alfred convinced Ray that Jean, Rose, and Hester were being held by assassins willing to kill them if he didn't disclose Violet's location. Alfred Wells, drew his weapon, forced Ray to the car, and drove back to Kajan Pass. The whole way, he promised the women were still alive, and that he'd soon see them. Even in the face of death, Ray kept Violet's location secret and refused to give her up. Alfred pulled over on a different road than the one he brought the others to. He lied and said that they were waiting with his goons a mile or so into the canyon. When Alfred caught his leg on his sticker bush and stalled, Ray marched forward alone. When Alfred caught up, he shot Ray in the back, killing him instantly. Alfred thought Ray might be wounded and not dead, so he sent another shot through the back of Ray's head. Alfred then rolled his brother onto his back before leaving him to rot. Alfred fled the scene at 1 a.m., unsure what his next move was. Judge Frank Leonard set Al's trial to begin on October 21, 1941. Alfred Horace Wells Jr. seemed determined to avoid that date any way he could. As far as behavior goes, Alfred was not the picture of a model prisoner. He carved a fake gun out of soap in an escape effort. He also attempted suicide twice. On July 14th, Alfred Wells offered a full confession, but only if he could see Violet. Five days later, Kavanaugh escorted Violet into the county jail. The questioning officers attempted to get Alfred to say he offered his confession freely, without any incentives or promises. Alfred gave this statement. None of you are big enough or smart enough to make me talk. I want the gas chamber, and I want to get it over with. I only want the gas chamber. Kavanaugh let Alfred Horace Wells Jr. know he had enough to convict him, with or without his confession. Alfred, in his own defense, said that he lied about not remembering. He confessed that he was setting the stage for an insanity plea. If Alfred opted to escape execution, all hope was lost with that statement. The murders were premeditated and calculated. Alfred Horace Wells Jr. was not crazy. He was conniving and dangerous. His attorney exchanged Alfred S. insanity plea for a guilty one. The trial wasn't a long one, and the jury only convened for 15 minutes before they found Alfred Wells guilty of three counts of first-degree murder. On October 31, 1942, Judge Frank Leonard sentenced Al to die at San Quentin. He attempted to appeal his sentence and claimed he couldn't get a fair trial in San Bernardino, but his efforts were all in vain. When attorneys informed him that all chances for appeal were exhausted, Alfred Horace Wells Jr. shrugged his shoulders and said, It's all right with me. I haven't anything to live for. Alfred Horace Wells Jr. was 32 years at the time of his execution. Thank you for watching Death Row.